Welcome back again, everyone. Here is part three of our chapter four lecture series. This one entitled, An Empire of Freedom. The focus question for this section is, what were the meanings of British liberty in the 18th century? We are getting very close in our course of study to the period of the American Revolution. So it is important to take a moment to try to understand the concepts of freedom and liberty and even patriotism as they were understood amongst the British in the 18th century. Now, despite the centrality of slavery to the greater British economy, Great Britain prided itself on being the most advanced and freest nation on the planet. It was the era's greatest naval and commercial power with a highly complex governmental system that was quite unlike even any other European system at the time. Now, British patriotism developed and strengthened during the 18th century, particularly in, as a result of the multiple wars against France that helped to sharpen this sense of national identity and its juxtaposition of French or even other European identities at that. Patriotism asserted itself more and more throughout the 18th century amongst British society, and that included the British colonies as well. Now, the concept of the British Constitution and the rights and liberties enshrined within it became central to conceptions of British identity in the 18th century. Now, the British Constitution was not a document that was written down. It was based on that rule of British common law, which was that amorphous body of unwritten law based on royal edicts, parliamentary decisions, judges' decisions, traditional practice that made up this body of law and practice as it existed in Britain and the British colonies at the time. But but when enshrined within this amorphous body of law were concepts of representation in government, individual rights, including rights of property and trial by jury, and legal restraints on political authority that put tethers on the government and particularly the monarchy that had to operate within a body and rule of law just as common citizens did as well. Increasingly important in 18th century British social and political life were conceptions of republican liberty. Now, republicanism at its core is the idea of representative government and a body of citizens that participates in political life and elects those representatives. And the ideas of republican liberty in Britain and British colonies in the 18th century celebrated participation in public life, specifically by economically independent citizens. This was considered the essence of liberty in British political life at the time. Now, economically independent was key there because it was thought that only those who owned land, who paid taxes, who had a stake in the game were free enough, were capable enough of managing government and public affairs. Also wrapped up in this idea of Republican liberty were ideas of virtue or civic virtue, which was considered paramount for a well-functioning republic. It was thought that only those who displayed virtue enough to subside their own individual personal desires, wants, or interests to the greater good could actively participate and foster a functional republican society. 
Also central to 18th century British ideas of liberty and freedom were concepts of liberal freedom. Now, liberalism is the mirror image of republicanism in many ways, whereas republicanism celebrates public virtue and public participation. Liberalism celebrates individual and private virtue and rights and freedoms. And really, the two balance each other to create an overarching, coherent system where liberalism and republicanism reinforce each other to illustrate and delineate the responsibilities of the individual to society and government, and vice versa, the responsibilities of government to society and the individual. 18th century English political philosopher John Locke was the first to really put all of these ideas together in a coherent form in his two treatises of government. This document put forth the idea of the social contract between government and the people, the idea of those mutually reinforcing responsibilities between the two. He also put forth the ideas of the government protection of life, liberty, and property. Property rights were key to British conceptions of liberty and freedom. He also discussed rights of the individual, consent of the governed, the right of rebellion against oppressive government, especially if government does not meet its obligations to the people. John Locke based all of these ideas on a notion of natural rights, rights that were above the domain of the government to grant, so therefore it was not the domain of the government to take those away. Whether they these rights were granted by God or by nature, whatever the conception was, they were above governmental authority. Now this idea was revolutionary at the time and really upended what was considered the natural order of society and government's function within that order. Also, these ideas opened the door to marginalized peoples, enslaved Africans, Native Americans, all other marginalized people around the world to claim those rights as well. Although that was not Locke's intention, certainly, but ideas have a very curious way of taking hold and spreading beyond where they are originally intended to go. That concludes part three of our chapter four lecture series. As always, study hard, and I'll see you soon.